Okay, good morning. This is about LISA, which is uh, LIGO in space. The main difference is the scale. This is a million kilometer kind of device instead of a kilometer like LIGO. And the frequency of the wave, which are a fraction of a second for LIGO. And uh, here we're talking waves that oscillate in hours or so. In that frequency range, the sources are enormous. We're talking million solar masses, black holes with their galaxies around that collide. And these signals are so huge that they are detectable with very large signal to noise ratio, basically from the dawn of the universe, a dozen billion years ago. So it's a different astronomy relative to that of LIGO and very, very rich. The physics of the instrumentation for the space project is fascinating. It's really measuring a millionth or billionth of a meter at the two million kilometer distance, that's fascinating, right? In addition to LIGO, there's a project that's uh, under design for space called LISA, Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. This is a project that's on the books in Europe right now. Uh, it's in some sense LIGO's big brother. Uh, it's a much longer baseline. It's a satellite-based antenna where we launch and we go uh, quite, quite far away from the Earth. It's going to see a different kind of gravitational wave than we see from a different class of sources. It's now slated to launch in 2034. The idea of LISA is that the two masses in two different uh, satellites are the equivalent of the mirror which you have on LIGO. And if a, a gravitational wave comes, then the distance between these two test masses changes slightly. And this is what then you measure by interferometry and the laser. But uh, you want to be sure that changes in the distance between the masses is due to a gravitational wave and not due to other forces and things like that. LISA will be doing gravitational wave astronomy uh, from space and also looking at a different frequency regime which is unreachable from the Earth. So I'll do an electromagnetic astronomy um, analogy. Um, there is no way we could have had uh, X-ray astronomy uh, without space X-ray detectors. The reason is that the atmosphere of the Earth is blocking X-rays. So there is no X-ray telescope we can have on the ground. Similarly, gravitational waves have a spectrum. They have a range of frequencies, and some frequencies we can never see from the ground. So LISA has to be a space mission to reach gravitational wave sources in a regime of frequencies that are unreachable from the ground. In space, we have to wait perhaps uh, after uh, the LISA um, um, mission uh, will happen, let's say in the next maybe 20 years or 30 years. We will be able to see a picture, a snapshot of the universe at very, very early time, at a time much earlier than when uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation was emitted that today uh, we measure very well. Right now, most people think that a space-based laser interferometric detector has the best chances to go to the very early universe. The universe was not transparent for any type of electromagnetic waves for the first 380,000 years. But it was always transparent for gravitational waves from the very first moment on. And so that gives me some vague hope that someday we'll be sensitive enough to disentangle these signals and maybe get a bit closer to understanding what was at the beginning, if there was a beginning. To see this uh, signal from the early universe uh, will be certainly the greatest discovery ever. We have now three detectors working. We'll soon have two more. We have one we're building in India, a LIGO, with the collaboration of the Indian physicists and Indian government. That'll be ready in the 2025 era. There's one in Japan that has some advanced techniques which should be working within the next few years, giving us better localization. We know that we should at least think and do the R&D and possibly ask to be funded for a concept that would exploit our sites where we have LIGO to their fullest extent. And so we've basically done conceptual designs of that. We can improve by making a much heavier mirrors 
By using a different material in the mirrors, we're presently looking at silicon. By lowering the temperature modestly, by uh, improving a limitation we have that is the coatings, the optical coatings on the mirrors, and by making yet a more powerful laser. Advanced LIGO uses uh, glass, which is uh, so beautiful, I, I don't even have an analogy for it, but it's uh, so purely made that if you set it to ringing, not that you would do this, but if you whacked it like this, it would ring a hundred million times before it stopped vibrating. And, and that's because there's no, it's so pure, the energy doesn't go anywhere. If, you, you're, if you're, you're here in town on a Sunday morning toward the north side of town, there's some church bells which wake you up. And those church bells, um, they go bong at a few hundred hertz, but they only last for about five or 10 seconds. Eh, that's the best church bells you got, we'll do that. But these pieces of glass we have in LIGO, the fibers and the mirrors, they go on for hundreds of millions of cycles, if not more. We'd, and we'd, we just run out of patience to measure them and it's because they're so pure inside. And that seems like the end of what you can do, but it's not. It's, it's a, uh, it seems like, maybe it seems like it should, maybe we should say, good enough, we got all that we're gonna get out of this, let's move on. But every time we've said that, when we really try to examine, are we really, really at the limits or just at the place where it gets hard? It turns out we're just at the place where it gets hard. And once we start thinking about it in a new way, all of a sudden, what we thought was a limit is not a limit anymore. And in the past year, we've come through a couple of revolutions in our thinking of where uh, these instruments can go sensitivity-wise. One option for improving our sensitivity is just making the arms longer because there's kind of a guaranteed sensitivity improvement just by making your arms longer. There are other ways of thinking about reducing the motion of the mirror, but, uh, and people will pursue those. but. Uh, we probably also want to have this just guaranteed simple improvement of just having long arms. Long arms. Yeah, me. <laughs> um, basically, until until about 40 kilometers, the longer the better. So as big as you can make it. We're thinking about basically LIGO times 10. Basically, taking the existing LIGO detector and making it 10 times longer. Right now, we can't actually do that at the sites we're at right now. We can't do it at Hanford and Livingston. So we would have to find new sites to be able to do that. The best way to do that would be to actually put one interferometer here in the US. People are thinking about West Texas or New Mexico or maybe Utah. There are lots of places where you could think about putting it. Uh, and then also putting one somewhere else, preferably in the Southern Hemisphere. And I personally think that's the right way to go. One, you can just by you know, lengthening the arms of the interferometer, the, you know, the simple, the simple naive physics tells you that you get more sensitive instead of four kilometers, you're 40 kilometers. And the second thing is that you can basically use the technologies that we're using now. You can use the same kind of lasers, maybe with a little more power. You can use the same type of mirrors, maybe a little bigger. So you've got to do a little work to do that. You've, the, the hard thing might actually be the vacuum system. You've got to make 80 kilometers of, of, of vacuum here. And thinking about how you do that in a cost-effective way turns out to be something that people are starting to, to say, that's where the money's going to go, so we have to do that better. So there is a consensus today across the scientific community and the funding agencies that the undertaking of uh, third generation gravitational wave observatories, it will have to be a global effort. It cannot be undertaken just by a single country. Not only because you need a network of detectors all across the globe to be able to triangulate the location of the source, but also because of the cost. Uh, the latest estimations that I've seen put each uh, facility at the level of several billion dollars. It's already basically in this community ideas that are fairly well developed for how you would move to the next generation detector. There's two main concepts right now on the table. One is to go underground, make the detector cryogenic so it's cooler. This very much helps the lower frequencies. We're going underground, there's less shaking of the earth, cooling the detectors, you have less thermal noise. This is a concept that's been developed in Europe. 
and it's called the Einstein Telescope, and they've been working on it for about five or so years, and it's pretty firmly designed. Einstein Telescope has a really unique configuration. Instead of an L shape, it actually is a triangle, and in each vertex of the triangle, there are, there are two lasers that send beams, in two beams, down each of the arms. That's a total of six interferometers. Third generation detectors are about frequencies that are maybe a little broader than what we can do with advanced LIGO now, uh, but it's more about having deeper sensitivity. So it's the difference uh, between having a small telescope that we used to have 100 years ago versus having the big telescopes on the ground that we have now. So it's in increasing our ability to observe fainter things in roughly the same frequency regime from the Earth. Now, why are we looking into this when we have these current detectors. The reason is that, of course, we're not looking at ge third generation detectors to be built next year or five years from now. But if we think about how long it took for us to get to the point of having advanced LIGO and Virgo working, if we go backwards in time and look at the origins of the current detectors, they go decades back. The origins of the thinking the quantifying, the science drivers go decades uh, far back in time. So we are doing this kind of work now, looking into um, what we will have 10, 15, 20 years from now, if we can have those detectors 20 years from now, and then they will be operating for another 20 to 30 years. So it is really work that we are doing for the future of the scientific community and for the next generation of gravitational wave astronomers. We don't know how far you can get using this kind of technology on the Earth. If we use modern technology, the best optics we can get, the best lasers we can get, it looks to me like even on the Earth, we should be able to detect the earliest, earliest black holes in the universe. And it's amazing to say that, to go from the place of having nothing to having a few, to then saying, with this next generation, we'll be able to detect black holes out to the edge of the universe. There's different ways to think about what happens next, right? And uh, one of the main things is to think about what we can do with this instrument to make it better, right? And I think uh, the most immediate answer, beyond just getting advanced LIGO to the sensitivity it was designed for, is to inject squeeze states. So, as people know that uh, the interferometer is getting better and better, we are hitting the limit of the very basic noise limit, which is called quantum limit. It's surprising that we are using a four kilometer detector, but we need to concern that a tiny, tiny amount of noise. So for this quantum noise, it's a basic quantum limit that Heisenberg said that we have a limit that we cannot go through. And we are hitting that limit. So we begin to think about the question that how can we go around that? How can we do better than this limit? Is that you take the vacuum of quantum electrodynamics, the vacuum fluctuations of light, and you modify that vacuum by what is called squeezing, and you inject the squeezed vacuum into the back end of the interferometer. It's, it sounds just crazy, but this turns out to be absolutely crucial for the future of this field. You modify the vacuum, you squeeze it, so it's the vacuum that squeezed or the laser that squeezed? It's the vacuum that squeezed. But you squeeze the vacuum that's entering and then that beats against the laser light. It sounds like some superpower that we can <laughs> squeeze the vacuum. Quantum engineering of light. I love this. Quantum, we're basically manipulating photons to do our to do our beckoning. We have a bunch of different squeezing experiments here. Uh, this one is a squeezing device that we're building here. Uh, we're testing and making a prototype here, and then when it's ready, we're gonna actually install it in LIGO. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna reduce the quantum noise of our detectors, hopefully by a factor of two. Uh, our sensitivity will be increased by a factor of two, 
and the idea is that that will increase the volume of space we can see by almost a factor of 10. We are making the interferometer to look at the universe to detect the gravitational waves and we are trying to make the range which is how far we can see the universe to detect gravitational waves. Okay, so here I'm showing the improvements that the squeezer is making for the interferometer. So this blue curve is showing that the sensitivity that we have without squeezing the interferometer. And this red curve is showing after we inject the squeezing how much we improve. I always think it's like, the interferometer is like a tiger that is running really fast. And we have put some wings for that so that the tiger can fly. The thing I see about squeezing that's so powerful is uh, it's also, we can't conceive of any uh, interferometric detectors that would not have squeezing. Every design we come up with will have some, will, will use squeezing to make it better. So I kind of feel like it's really, it's, it's the path of the future.